Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, everyone. The labor, now you can tell I'm reading off a script. The Labor Industry and Veterans and Military Affairs and Finance Policy Committee will come to order. I would like to announce that this meeting will take place in accordance with House Rule 10.01. This, this meeting may be viewed on House Public Information TV, which is available on the House website. As is custom with this committee, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Ms. Doyle, will you please take the roll. Chair Eklund. Present. Vice Chair Zhang. Present. Representative Detmer. Detmer, present. Representative McDonald. Donald, present. Representative Berg. Berg, present. Representative Bliss. Bliss, present. Representative Edelson. Present. Representative Frederick. Present. Representative Greenman. Present. Representative Nelson. Present. House of Representatives Committee. Representative Poston. Present. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, present. Representative Sundin. Present. We have a quorum. Quorum is present. Next on the agenda is approval of minutes from March 10th, 2021. Representative Raleigh, have you taken a look at the minutes? I will try somebody else. Representative Nelson, have you taken a look at the minutes? Yes, and I approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Representative Mo uh, Nelson uh, moves approval of the minutes from March 10th, 2021. Any comments or corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor of the adoption of the minutes, please say aye. 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 All say nay. Aye. Minutes. The minute. We've got whoever opposed. Is there, a, is, is there a correction to the minutes? No, sorry, Mr. Chairman. It was, I said I had an late aye to approve the okay. All right, thank you, Representative McDonald. The minutes are approved. First bill on the agenda is House File 1181 from Chair Bernardi. I will move that House File 11, 1181 be referred to Ways and Means. Chair Bernardi, welcome to the committee and please explain your bill. Oh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Today before the committee, I have House File 1181. This is a higher, a higher education agency policy bill. It contains various substantive and technical changes to higher education statutes regarding financial aid, scholarship, regulation of post-secondary institutions, and state college savings plan. I'll, walk, I'll have the Office of Higher Education walk through the provisions, and but I'll just share a few of the highlights that are really student support centered within the bill. And I do want to add, it just passed out of our Higher Education Committee with a unanimous support from all of our members. The, um, the, the three things I'm gonna just mention before we move on is that the COVID-19 has disrupted higher education paths for students. And this bill helps ease the burden of the pandemic's impact by extending eligibility to the state grant or child care grant program if students were forced to take time away from school to care for a sick loved one. And then it also does another thing. It breaks down barriers for students and graduates who need access to their transcript records. We know how important it is to have the proof of post-secondary experience when someone is applying for a job or another training program. And although these are simple fixes, they are important and necessary, especially for students' economic I muted. You muted yourself, Chair Bernardi. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and then the, la the last thing I want to point out is how we need more protections for our students who attend the um, private uh, private institutions, and particularly um, addressing the needs to make sure that we never have a situation that happened to Argosy students when they the school abruptly closed and they were um, 
their their economic security and their hard work was um, at stake. And so we want to be sure this never happens again. And we were able to uh, put provisions in there that we had bipartisan support and that will help our our students. So I want to uh, focus on the highlights for this committee, which is the dual um, the dual um, trans, the dual training program. And we were uh, fortunate to have a um, one of the original authors of this bill in our committee, um, Representative Marion O'Neill. And so it was excellent to have her in the committee on this. And what I'll just share with you is the part that we made changes to is that in removing all the old competency standard definition for dual training grants, replacing it with a new definition, clarifying eligible employer grantees, training providers, and application changes as it relates to eligibility among numerous technical language changes. And with that, I will, um, it, I would like our testifiers to just um, share with you a little bit more detail about these changes. Thank you, Chair Bernardi. First testifier. Which I have is, uh, 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 um, Ms. Oliver, Ms. Oliver. Yes. Ms. Ol uh, Nikki Oliver, Nikki, I hope I get your name right, Office of Higher Ed. Ms. Oliver, please proceed with, or identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, for the record, my name is Nikki Oliver. You did a good job. I know it's spelled different, <laughs> uh, Chair. Um, and I am the Manager of Grants and Government Relations for the Office of Higher Education. Um, and I actually have a colleague of mine, Megan Fitzgibbon, who is actually the manager over the dual training grants program, which is the sections that I believe uh, Rep uh, Chair Bernardi, Representative Bernardi wants us to speak to today. So I will actually pass it over to her to, to talk about those changes. And I believe of this bill, there's sections, uh, excuse me, sections. Five, it's five through, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Chair Bernardi. It's uh, sections five through 12. Thank you, Rep. Yeah. Rep. Bernardi. Apologies. Um, and I just, the one thing that I will like to state prior to uh, Ms. Fitzgibbon speaking is that all of these changes were in consultation with the Department of Labor and Industry um, as part of their pipeline program and uh, stakeholders. And um, primarily the changes are just putting into practice into statute for the program. Um, if, if possible, I'd like to pass it over to uh, Megan Fitzgibbon that could talk in more detail about what these changes actually do. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. Ms. Fitzgibbon, please uh, identify yourself for the record and proceed. Hi, thank you, Chair and members. This is, uh, for the record, my name is Megan Fitzgibbon and I'm a state financial aid manager with the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. Um, I, uh, this, like Nikki said, um, this um, provision in our bill uh, essentially is putting into practice, putting into statute what we have been operating at and just clarifying things. Um, especially with um, some guidance from the Attorney General's office about a couple of things about um, how we should probably have things in statute. Um, so I can, I can go section by section and cover um, a, a good part of it if you'd like. Please um, proceed. Thank you. Um, in section five, um, the, uh, we're really just um, removing the competency standard uh, definition, which is uh, not in a definition section and then we're moving it down into the definition section and then so that's where section six starts um, so section six actually creates a definition subdivision um, which starts with competency standard which is a, um, a definition in the department of labor and industry um, statutes um, and then we also provide a definition for eligible training. Um, so this uh, grant pays for specific related instruction training that's part of a dual training program. Um, and we're being very specific about what uh, training is eligible for reimbursement under the grant. Um, it is training that is towards one or more of the competency standards that are identified through the Department of Labor and Industry Pipeline Program. Um, a majority of the training has to be instructor led. Um, so we have had situations where employers have wanted to put their employees through 
um, training that really is just um, reading things, uh, material online um, and taking a short assessment perhaps or not even taking a cert assessment and just getting a certificate of completion at the end. Um, and um, we have not found that those are um, beneficial and for dual training programs in particular. And so we're trying to be clear that a majority of the training um, in a funded program must be instructor led. But those instructors could be online. They don't necessarily have to be in person. So some of these things are definitely online virtual training, but instructors are part of it. Um, and then we make it clear that uh, the training has to result in an employee receiving an industry recognized degree certificate or credential. Following that, we define um, what an eligible training provider is. So this uh, program does require uh, employers and grantees to have an agreement on file with an eligible training provider. We just take what we've been doing in practice and, and put it in here. So this includes all of the um, post-secondary institutions as well as um, other trainees, uh, trainers that um, that you wouldn't necessarily think of that might be exempt. So these are all many of the ones, very technical ones that might provide training just for specific employers on different types of equipment and things like that. Um, we also define what industry recognized degree certificate or credential means. Um, all the things that you would think of are here, apprenticeship, all the academic degrees and certificates, um, as well as other um, certifications that might be recognized or approved um, or issued by particular industry councils or associations. Um, section seven and eight, um, do a little bit of cleanup, um, remove a few things, and then um, that are in other areas um, and in the definitions section. Um, but then we do add in here that a grantee must have an agreement on file before payment. Um, there's another part of the statute, which we've actually removed, um, that um, requires an agreement be on file before the application for a grant. Um, we found that um, employers and training providers are um, have been hesitant to actually have an agreement on file before they even know whether they're going to get a grant. Um, so we're making it clear that um, that agreement does have to be on file, but not until we're actually paying the grant or prior to payment of the grant. Um, and then uh, we make it clear here uh, that, uh, you know, again, talking about eligible training programs um, or training providers and the inventory that actually we work with on um, and provide collaboratively with the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, sections nine through 12 are really just conforming um, um, statute changes amendments um, just to reference the definitions section um, as opposed to redefining things. Um, the only other um, substantive change is in subdivision six um, where we are making it clear that um, employers who um, are required, large employers who are required to provide a match as part of this program, that um, large employers are defined as those with $25 million or more in annual gross revenue. We've been operating under that through um, you know, conversations with um, our internal auditors and the attorney general's office and others just to clarify which revenue it is that we should be using and we are using gross. So we're just putting that into statute to make sure that it's clear. Um, well, that's, uh, like I said, the rest of the uh, sections are um, just updating and, and clarifying and pointing towards the definitions. Um, so with that, I, I can stand for questions if there are any. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fitzgibbon. Chair Bernardi, do you have any other testifiers? No, that would be it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, member questions? Seeing none, no further, no comments. Uh, Chair Bernardi, any final remarks up from you? Well, thank you again, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. It is an honor to work on a bill bipartisanly and together to help our students be successful in completing their training programs and getting their credentials. And so I, I thank you and appreciate your support for this bill. Thank you. I will renew my motion that House File 1181 be re-referred to Ways and Means. Ms. Doyle, please take the roll. Chair Eklund? 
Yes. Eklund, aye. Vice Chair Zhang. Aye. Zhang, aye. Representative Detmer. Detmer, aye. Detmer, aye. Representative McDonald. McDonald, aye. McDonald, aye. Representative Berg. Yes. Berg, aye. Representative Bliss. Aye. Bliss, aye. Representative Edelson. Aye. Edelson, aye. Representative Frederick. Representative uh, aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman, aye. Representative Nelson. Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Poston. Aye. Poston, aye. Representative Raleigh. Representative Sundin. Raleigh, aye. Raleigh, aye. Representative Sundin. Aye. Sundin, aye. There are 13 ayes, zero nays. 13 eyes and zero nays. Chair Bernardi, you're, you're on your way. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. Next bill on the agenda is House File 762 from Representative Meckland. I will move that House File 762 be referred to the General Register. Representative welcome, uh, Meckland, welcome to the committee and please explain your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So House File 762 is a bill that puts in a statute that protects the contract recovery fund that was established back in, I believe, 1994. Um, these funds are paid in by us licensed contractors to create a safety net if, uh, if somebody falls victim to like a fraudulent, what, what are those people saying here? Um, deceptive, uh, dishonest practices and, and or like if somebody, if a contractor was to go out of business and something came up later. Um, these funds are very important. Uh, you know, we, we wanted to really work to make some other corrections uh, and uh, offer an amendment. Um, as uh, Chair Eklund, you and I have had this conversation. There's other modifications, and what we've kind of agreed to, as well as this underlying bill, is protecting these funds. We put together a, a, a work group going forward in the interim, and then come back next year with a really good bill. And I, I have a testifier that would like to speak to that briefly, if I may. That would be Mr. Schaefer. Thank you, Representative Mecklen. Uh, Testifier is David Schaefer from the Minnesota Solar Energy Industries Association. Mr. Schaefer, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, Chair Eklund, members of the committee, my name is David Schaefer and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Solar Energy Industries Association, or MNCIA. We represent about 100 and different solar, 120 different solar companies or solar related businesses that employ around 4,200 Minnesotans. I'm here today in support of House File 762, and I wanna thank Representative Mecklen for authoring this bill. And I wanna thank you all for hearing my testimony today. Solar in Minnesota comes in a litany of different forms, whether it's utility scale, commercial industrial, or community solar. But the genesis of solar in Minnesota is really residential installations. Many of our members who were residential installers a decade ago still put solar on people's homes today. They know that installing solar on a house is a lot of electrical work, but it also seems to cross the line into residential building contractor work at times. Equipment is being put on a roof to effectively remodel its appearance and roof punctures are often made. So a large number of my member companies that do residential solar work have not only become electrical contractors, but they've also acquired a residential building contractor's license. These dual licenses are a way to make sure that they are able to promise high quality solar installation that is both bonded and provides customers access to the residential building contractors fund if something unfortunate were to occur. This bill helps ensure that the residential building contractors fund is used for its intended purpose. It will protect the fund from undue intrusion and will make sure that dual licensed solar installers can promise customers that they will be taken care of. The fund will be preserved, which is really important here today. But this bill is also the start of a bigger conversation. It's the beginning of some necessary improvements. Right now, having a residential building contractor's license is not a requirement in Minnesota to become a solar installer, nor is it required to make a solar sale. This has had the result of leaving customers out in a lurch when solar companies that have chosen not to get a residential building contractor's license have committed fraud or have otherwise gone defunct. Three solar companies have done something like this in the last three years, two with clear intentionality and one where the facts are too fresh to opine on. In two of those instances, the solar installers did not carry the residential building contractor's license. My understanding is that the customers associated with one of the contractors that did were able to recoup some of their dollars back from the recovery fund, although admittedly not enough when attorney's fees were taken out. 
Whereas the other customers from the other companies are either still working on recovery without a clear pathway for being made whole, or they have acknowledged that recovery is not a viable option. This is unacceptable and the regulatory burden is so light. My understanding is the license is about $500 and requires passing a test. As Representative Mecklen spoke to in his testimony, he wants to create a task force to tackle this issue and other residential building contractors fund reforms that will result in a better residential building contractors fund overall. We're proud to support that this, this initial bill and this initiative. This is the first step towards an improved system that works optimally for consumers and the solar industry wants to be a full-fledged participant in that process. With that, I can conclude my testimony and I'm happy to take any questions about the underlying bill or about the future initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Schaefer. Uh, any member questions on the bill? Uh, I'll, I'll have one quick one. Representative Mecklen, I know you've had uh, uh, quite a few talks with the Department of Labor Industry and and uh, they're all signed off on this bill. They, I, they haven't sent me any comments on it, so I assume they are, but I just want to hear from you. Um, thank you, Chair Eklund. Yes, they're in, in full support of this bill. They've also come to the table in full support of putting together a workforce study group to do this in the interim. So we, by the time we get back next year, we can have a, a good bill to put forward um, to make not only include, figure out this whole solar side of it, but also some other much needed changes to the recovery fund that makes it a little more accessible when people do fall victim to one of these circumstances. Um, and, and we have the builders associations are all on board. I mean, it, it, everybody I've talked to is in support of uh, coming together and we kind of have comprised a, a thought of, of how it'll look. We'll have, you know, a Senator from each side of the aisle, a rep from each side of the aisle, and we can all like put our brains together and make what makes the most sense to protect Minnesotans from these types of acts in the future. Thank you, Chair. Any other member questions? Uh, no, seeing no further comments, uh, final words, Representative Mecklen. Well, I appreciate you getting this in today. You know, in such a crucial time, this is a very important bill. Um, and I appreciate everybody's support. If I can count on it, uh, on, on all the work with uh, Mr. Schaefer, as well as the builders groups, um, this has been really, really important. And the Department of Labor has been very helpful. So um, I, I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Mecklen. I will renew my motion that House File 762 be referred to the General Register. Ms. Doyle, will you please take the roll? Chair Eklund. Yes. Eklund, aye. Vice Chair Zhang. Yes. Zhang, aye. Representative Detmer. Detmer, aye. Detmer, aye. Representative McDonald. McDonald for Mecklen, aye. McDonald, aye. Representative Berg. Yes. Berg, aye. Representative Bliss. Aye. Bliss, aye. Representative Edelson. Aye. Edelson, aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman, aye. Representative Nelson. Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Poston. Aye. Poston, aye. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, aye. Raleigh, aye. Representative Sundin. Representative Sundin. Aye. Sundin, aye. There are 13 ayes, zero nays. Representative Mecklen, 13 ayes, zero nays. You're on your way to the General Register. Thank you. Thank you. Final bill on the agenda today for today is House File 803 from Representative Sundin. Representative Sundin, would you like to move your bill? Representative Sundin, I think you're muted. But again, uh, I'm not clear on what my motion would be. My motion would be uh, to uh, advance be, uh, uh, to Judiciary and Finance and Civil Law. We that's my to motion, Mr. Chair. Representative Sundin moves that House File 803 be referred re referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. We do have a an A1 amendment. Would you like to explain the amendment, or should we adopt the amendment first, Chair Sundin? I can explain the amendment if you want. Please proceed. Uh, the, amendment, the amendment for 803 adds the definition of promisee, which is taken from current law and added uh, for parity. Uh, secondly, it deletes the uh, undefined uh, term public uh, building and construction contract and replaces it with already defined term public improvement. 
Uh, and uh, thirdly, it creates a uh, parity for the exception exemptions exceptions to the anti indemnity law in Minnesota statute. So uh, it's a good clarification uh, uh, and definitions. Any questions on the amendment? All those in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries and the amendment is adopted. Rep uh, Chair Sundin, please explain your bill. Uh, 803, uh, thanks for hearing this important bill. Uh, the goal of uh, House File 803 is to bring basic fairness to Minnesota construction contracts and help small businesses across the state. Today, large contractors are requiring smaller contractors to pay for and ensure their legal fees, no matter who is at fault. To fix this problem, we have House File 803. If this bill passes, a negligent party will pay and ensure their own legal fees. This bill is a move towards common sense and a reasonable level of responsibility for all people involved. The bill has support of 20 subcontractor associations. I have te two testifiers uh, today, Patrick Lee O'Halloran, who will talk about the bill and the law, and Tamara Sunby, who will share her personal experience and the practical realities of being a subcontractor in Minnesota. Thank you, Chair Sunday. And first up, uh, test fires, Patrick Lee O'Halloran, uh, TLL Law Construction Attorney. Mr. O'Halloran, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Patrick Lee O'Halloran. I'm an attorney in private practice with TTLO Law. I have specialized in construction law for more than 20 years. And my law firm also acts as chapter counsel for the Minnesota Subcontractors Association. I'd like to thank you all for hearing this important bill. I hope you pass it today. Um, I'd like to just provide a quick overview and then I'll walk through uh, the bill. Uh, back in 2013, the legislature amended the anti-indemnity statute to make it clear that indemnity agreements in construction contracts could only hold contractors responsible to the extent of their own fault or negligence. That's been the current law for eight years, well, seven and a half. Uh, after the law was passed, general contractors, not all of them, but uh, tried to get around the law by increasing the obligations of subcontractors to defend general contractors. And so today the law is being used to pass unfair risk onto small businesses. General contractors are now requiring subcontractors to defend general contractors by making their subcontractors pay their legal fees throughout a dispute that the subcontractors cannot be required to indemnify them for. Today, subcontractors are being required to defend the general contractor even when the general contractor is solely negligent. This practice is unfair, dangerous, and passes all risk down onto the smallest construction businesses. Uh, these unfair practices happen every day. Every day, subcontractors are asked to sign these provisions or forego the work. These provisions are rarely removed and are typically not negotiable. These provisions put subcontractors in the position of incurring additional costs to try and negotiate these unfair terms out of their contracts or face the risk of massive liability if something arises on the project, which is outside of your control. There are several examples in the materials we have given you. One of them is a letter from GTS HVAC which is a woman-owned business, Tamara Sunby, the owner is here to testify, so I won't uh, steal her thunder. Um, it, there's also a document called Examples, Unfair Risks, which includes a contract being used this year requiring a subcontractor to pay a, legal, uh, a general contractor's legal fees despite fault, as well as two examples of unfair settlement negotiations from a Midwest insurance company. Uh, in 2017, the Joint Despair was issued, and there's a quote uh, from there, there's several quotes in that study, in fact, saying that this practice and insurance practice and costs are hurting businesses' bottom line. Um, and I can tell you, in the last two weeks, I've seen uh, at least four of these provisions across my desk. So this is a, a, daily, uh, a daily issue for the subcontractors. One consequence of this practice is it hurts the DBEs trying to make headway in our industry. They face excessive premiums to handle this unfair risk transfer. 
Um, there's a quote in the materials you've been given about how public sector insurance requirements are a barrier to businesses seeking public sector prime contracts and subcontracts. Um, and I just would uh, urge you to take a look at those quotes to understand how this is impacting our uh, minority and disadvantaged business contractors. And obviously, Ms. Sunby's testimony will speak to that as well. Uh, if you pass uh, House File 803, this unfair and dangerous practice will be stopped. Now, I'll, I'll quickly walk you through the bill. It does three things to end this abusive practice. First, if you sort of start in the back of the bill, it makes more sense. Uh, section three of the bill adds just one word, the word defend, to the definition of an indemnification agreement in Chapter 337. This closes the loophole that I just talked about that allows a negligent party to make someone else pay or insure their legal fees. Just like the current law for indemnity agreements, this would mean the separate defense obligation of a subcontractor would only be enforceable to extent of that subcontractor's own fault or negligence. Next, section four deletes the term project specific insurance at line 223 to remove ambiguous wording, which some try to use as a full indemnity exception. Third, this bill creates parity between public and private projects at sections one and two by taking these provisions of chapter 337 and pasting them into the public statute, section 1572. Now it's important to note, if this bill is passed, a general contractor could still require a subcontract to pay for and insure the general contractor for any costs related to the subcontractor's fault or negligence. The right to require insurance for someone's own fault is protected in 33702, and the right to require coverage to protect a general contractor's vicarious liability is specifically protected in 337.05, subdivision 1D, and has been since 2013. Again, this bill does not change that. Section 2 of the bill, as amended, would apply that identical exception to public projects. Uh, You've already heard there's a lot of support for the bill. 20 organizations and trade associations have signed on. Eight have submitted letters of support. I encourage you to read those letters to learn some more firsthand experiences with these defense provisions. I also want to comment briefly because I know the Associated General Contractors and the public agencies have raised some concerns. We've had several meetings with them. Uh, we're working with them on their issues and we will continue to do so. Um, I understand the agencies have shared a letter uh, with the committee indicating that this uh, bill, if passed, would increase their costs. I don't see any evidence of that. And in fact, I disagree. In our recent conversations, uh, at least one of the agency representatives admitted they don't have any data to support the notion that uh, this bill would increase their costs. Let me explain why I think that's not true. First of all, there's a trucking statute that's been in place since 2012. It's found at 221.87. It has almost the same language. It prohibits both defense and indemnity obligations beyond fault. Um, we've investigated, or rather the MSA has investigated, and hasn't heard of any complaints that 221.87 has caused problems or increased costs. Also, if you think about the practice we're concerned about, it's really asking somebody else to pay your pay their attorney's fees, even when they're not at fault. That's just an end run around what we call the American rule. In litigation, the American rule says, unless there is a contract or a statute that says otherwise, generally the parties pay their own dispute costs and legal fees. We don't think of that American rule as increasing costs or creating more costly litigation. This bill is just about basic fairness. Subcontractors are not trying to get out of being responsible for their own actions or their own legal fees. They just don't want to pay the general contractor's legal fees when the general is negligent. This is not a dramatic change for the fair contracts that are out there today. Instead, it provides a default standard of fairness for the most egregious contracts. And that's really important to understand is what this law says is a defense provision that requires you to defend somebody beyond your own fault or negligence is unenforceable, but rather it says it's enforceable only to the extent of your fault or negligence. So the provision stays in, it's just blue penciled into a more fair standard. We don't, uh, we don't uh, wanna wait and see a business closed down because of this unfair practice. 
We want this to be addressed now and bring fairness back to construction contracts in Minnesota. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'm happy to take questions if that's helpful. Thank you, Mr. O'Halloran. Next up is Tamara Sunby, GTS HVAC Incorporated. Ms. Sunby, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Mr. Chair and committee members, my name is Tamara Sunby and I'm the proud owner of GTS HVAC Incorporated. We are a woman owned union HVAC company and a disadvantaged business enterprise, DBE for short. We've been in business for 15 years and have three trucks in the field. We've made it through the pandemic and I hope to stay in business for another 20 plus years and hand it on to my sons or daughters. But many of the contracts that I am being asked to sign have put, uh, could put me out of business in a blink of an eye for someone else's mistakes. The defense demands that some general contractors are requiring um, both um, public and private work puts my business on the hook for their actions and their defense costs. It's not fair, it's not right, and it's gotta be fixed now. Why should I have to pay for someone else's mistakes or to ensure someone else's mistakes, especially if I have no authority over them. Seriously, I have asked myself, how is this even legal in Minnesota? I've had to turn down a number of jobs and potential job opportunities because of non-negotiable defense provisions. It's impacting the growth of my business. And I also have had to hire attorneys to argue contract terms even before I get the job, which means I'm paying for a project I might not even get. For example, right now, I am currently in negotiation with a general contractor on a public project that would be equal to one third of my annual revenue. I may be forced to turn this project down if they won't allow me to delete these very defense terms we're trying to get through here. I can't accept this project if I have to take on everyone's risk. I'm really hopeful that the public owners would support this bill and help the very DBEs are asking to work on these projects to have fair work and fair contracts. For many of my peers, I know they're signing these contracts. I talk to them every day. I know they're signing them because they need the work and many of them have no idea what they're signing or what they're putting their business at risk for or worst case scenario, they're being shamed and bullied into it. I'm testifying today because I wanna help end this unfair practice for myself and others. I'm proud to be testifying in this Women in Construction Week. Guess there's no guys that would come forward and testify, so well, here I am. I'm just asking you today to please pass forward this House File 803 and bring common sense back to Minnesota construction contracts. Thanks, and I'll stay for any questions if you have any. Thank, thank you, Ms. Ms. Sunby. Next up is uh, Jim County, Minnesota Department of uh, Minnesota DOT, Deputy Chief Counsel. Mr. County, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Jim County, and I'm Deputy Chief Counsel at MnDOT, and I work extensively with our construction contracts. I'm here today to express concerns over how this bill potentially has unintended consequences for the legal risks of MnDOT, the Department of Administration, and other public project owners. As public project owners, we actually agree that the defense of claims should be handled uh, by the party that is most likely at fault, but we think this bill unintentionally actually puts that defense in jeopardy. Now there's a legal principle that says the duty to defend is broader than the duty to indemnify and there's a good policy reason for that. And I don't think it's the intent of this bill to change that legal principle, but I'm concerned that the bill will have that effect. Specifically, I'm concerned that adding the word defend to the definition of an indemnity agreement makes the statute a bit circular and makes it tough to apply. What I mean by that is at the time a lawsuit is filed, there's been no determination that a party has been negligent or otherwise acted wrongfully. Um, there's really just only an allegation. Now the, the bill language seems to leave open the possibility that a prime owner could, a prime contractor, for example, could simply refuse the owner's tender of the defense of a lawsuit saying, well, nobody has found that I'm 
have been negligent or have acted wrongfully. Um, so uh, that's kind of why I say it, that it's a little bit circular. Um, in other words, we don't have a duty to defend because we haven't been found uh, negligent. So the, the question that I think the bill language leaves is how does the uh, how does a contractor defend to the extent of its negligence before it's actually been found negligent? So that's uh, kind of the circularity of the bill language, I think. And so this might leave uh, public project owners in the position of defending claims that really the prime contractor should be defending, even though the prime contractor actually has insurance that will cover the cost of that defense. Um, so again, it's important to understand the timing of these two duties. The duty, the duty to indemnify arises at the end of the case and is based on determination of fault, um, whereas the duty to defend ar arises at the beginning of the case when there's just an allegation of fault. There's no, you know, adjudication or determination of fault. Um, you know, admittedly, there are ways to bring a reluctant contractor into a lawsuit, such as being a third party defendant, but those increase the cost of lawsuits and in, and in my view may make the construction lawsuits tougher to settle. Um, and it's, it's hard to understand how this might work without some post litigation um, shifting of defense costs, uh, which is sort of contrary to, to the American rule. Now, MnDOT, the Department of Administration and other public owners certainly support the intent here, which is to have contract provisions that are fair to all participants in the construction process. Um, we're simply concerned about unintended consequences that would force public project owners to defend claims that should really be defended by the prime contractors or others. Now I can't quantify, um, you know, increased bid costs on our project, but you know I can tell you that obviously if we spend um, legal costs, those are dollars that we don't spend on additional public projects, right? So if our legal costs go up, um, the money that we devote to projects goes down. Um, and you know, lastly. Um, Projects are unique, and we should really allow for flexibility in how projects are insured. You know, quite simply, renovating the capital is not the same as building a bridge or building a city hall. Um, so I understand the proponents say their their intent is is not to change the flexibility of uh, how owners might require projects to be insured, and uh, we appreciate that intent. But again, we think there there may be a, an un unintended consequence there. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. This concludes my remarks, and I'm happy to uh, answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Coney. Next up is uh, Laura Ziegler, Associate General Contractors of Minnesota. Ms. Ziegler, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Laura Ziegler with Associate General Contractors of Minnesota. Thank you to Chair Eklund and Representative Sundin for the opportunity to provide some context today, and we appreciate the continued dialogue on House File 803. Our association has over 400 members statewide and represents both the horizontal and vertical commercial construction industry. The majority of our contractors choose to be signatories to unions. Despite our name, we have subcontractors, specialty subcontractors, and other industry stakeholders in the commercial construction industry as members. Some of our members are always subcontractors or a downstream contractor. In many instances, a general contractor in one project might be a sub in the next project. Some general contractors do not self-perform the project work. Other generals will perform some work in a project. As you can see, the scenarios for delivering a project are varied, and these realities provide us with a comprehensive view of various perspectives and knowledge of the industry. The primary concern, as already stated with the bill, as written, has to do with one word, and that is defend. As legislators, you know the effect a single word can have, like shall or may. The bill in its current form equates indemnity to defense. As decades of case law have shown us, these two duties are distinct obligations by insurers, and Minnesota would be an outlier if this legislation passed. That concludes my comments, Mr. Chair, and I would like to invite one of my members to build on my intro and provide an example for the committee. Um, Ms. Ziegler, we don't have the name of that testifier. Uh, if, if he could be brief, he or she could be brief, that would be 
uh, acceptable, I guess. Oh, okay. Now I got it. Next on the list is Connie Armstrong, McGuff Construction. I hope I got that right. Uh, Ms. Armstrong, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. I, you're muted, Ms. Armstrong. There we go. Is that better? I do it all the time. Don't worry about it. No worries. Thank you. Good morning. Good, good afternoon. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Connie Armstrong. As you mentioned, I'm senior counsel at McGough Construction Company. We are commercial union general contractor based out of St. Paul. At McGough, I'm responsible for contract negotiations, insurance procurement, and claims management. I've also served on the AGC's contract committee. Prior to McGough, I was a litigation attorney in private practice defending contractors and subcontractors in construction litigation and during my time with the National Guard, I've also served as a contracting officer, awarding and administering contract construction contracts for the military. Um, today, we have two main concerns with House File 803. The first resides in Subdivision 3, Subsection 3, as Laura already spoke to with the addition of the word defend. I want to note today that if this change is solely preventing a wholly innocent party from being required to defend for another party, another party for that party's sole negligence or the fault of the other parties, I would not be here testifying and McGough would not be in opposition to this. The concern with the proposed bill is that it could be read to do the opposite by actually shifting the obligation of defense from the alleged at fault party and their insurer to faultless parties who are responsible for them. Under Minnesota law, an upstream contractor such as McGough and the work that it does is vicariously liable and responsible for its downstream subcontractors acts and omissions. By way of example, McGough hires many subcontractors to complete a single project. We have roofers, window installers, HVAC subcontractors, landscapers, painters, you name it. If an owner claims that windows have excessive condensation and claims that there's a defect in the window, the window's installation and the humidification system is causing excessive condensation, the owner can make a claim for damages directly against McGuff, strictly because of our vicarious liability for all of the subcontractors that we retain. Because of this, the industry has established a system that reasonably and appropriately allows McGough to require defense and indemnification from the parties and their insurers whose work is at issue. The defense and indemnification obligations are separate and distinct. The defense obligation itself consists of paying the defense costs, which include attorney's fees, expert court costs, etc. This defense obligation, as Mr. County already testified to, is triggered at the time the allegations are made. And that is when the costs associated with the defense start to accrue. So in my example, McGough could require the window installer, the window manufacturer, and the HVAC contractor to collectively defend McGough from the owner's claims that arise out of, and because they arise out of, the allegations related to those subcontractors' work. The indemnification, on the other hand, requires the at-fault party to pay the damages associated with their fault that another party may be required to pay. That indemnification obligation is triggered upon a finding of fault and a determination of damages. Back to my example again, if it's determined that the installation of the windows was the sole cause of the damages, then the window installer would have to indemnify or pay McGough the damages but McGuff would have to pay the owner. This system allocates responsibility for the defense costs to the allegedly at-fault parties who will benefit from the defense and allocates the responsibility for the damages to the at-fault party for those damages. This is an equitable allocation. This is how insurance tracks and how it provides coverage for defense and indemnification. What I want to clarify today is that we agree that if an uninvolved party, like the landscaper or the carpet installer in my example, should not be required to pay, to pay um, or provide defense in the circumstances where there are no claims that arise out of their work. 
We don't benefit from it. They don't benefit from a defense and they're not at fault for the damages. But there is concern that the current statute doesn't already, if there is concern that the current statute doesn't already prohibit that, we can certainly work towards language that changes and carefully and specifically addresses that issue. The concern with the proposed bill is the language could be read much broader and in a manner that significantly changes the current obligations of the at fault party to take responsibility for the costs associated with their fault or their alleged fault. And that would be very inconsistent with the broad construction market and how the insurance policies would be required, would be required to provide coverage. This would likely lead to extensive litigation to address these non-market and unstandard issues. Increased litigation costs for all parties involved, including the downstream subcontractors and their insurers. Those increased costs will in turn increase costs for construction projects as a whole, which is not at all favorable to the construction market. The other concern that we have in House File 803 resides in subdivision four, excuse me, section four, subdivision one C, with the deletion of the phrase project specific insurance, including without limitation from the list of insurances that are allowed under the statute. There are a lot of industry-wide benefits to having project-specific insurance products. And McGuff currently has project-specific insurance in place on multiple of its projects. The parties that have likely benefited the most from these project policies in place on the projects are the small and disadvantaged companies. As these policies put them on equal playing field with their larger competitors, where they don't have to go and procure the insurance on their own, but are allowed to um, participate of and be covered by the project spe specific insurance that is provided. Eliminating this coverage um, as an option would not help the small businesses. It is for all these reasons that we are concerned with this bill. Thank you for your time and I'm available for any questions that may be necessary. Thank you, Ms. Armstrong and thank you to your, to your service to the state in Minnesota and the Guard. Next up is Cameron Boyd, General, General Counsel Metropolitan Airports uh, Commission. Mr. Boyd, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Eklund. My name is Cameron Boyd from Metropolitan Airports Commission. I'm actually not looking to testify today. I'm just here in case I can help with any questions that may arise in the course of the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Uh, members, questions? Before we get too much into questions, just uh, I remind you this bill is going to judiciary. That's where we'll be answering some of the legal questions that are arising from this bill. First up, Representative Detmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Sundin, for bringing this bringing this forward. Because uh, I'm glad it's going to the uh, uh, the next committee. Because a lot of these questions can be worked out uh, that we've just heard, and, and that's important. And uh, you know, I've I've had many uh, small subcontractors come to me um, over the years and have had this this has been an issue for them in terms of having their pay withheld. Uh, by the general contractor until things were resolved. And many times for a small contractor, that's a that can be a hard thing to do when, when they have money invested and they have employees and so forth. Um, so I think that's an issue that, I, that I've come across. And the, just the fairness in the industry, but I also understand uh, with the last three uh, testifiers, I think those are some issues. And I, I would hope that uh, Reps of Sundin, that when you take it to the next committee, that you've maybe bring these people together and uh, come up with some resolves. I know your your amendment uh, was to match up with the Senate language, and I don't know if uh, any if any of the last three testifiers or if have you talked to the people in the Senate about their language and how it matches with the House language. But this is an issue, and I, I hope that uh, this will help. Uh, not only the subcontractors, but the general contracts and the people that need the work done, uh, that hire the people. Those are all those those areas need to be worked out, and hopefully, it's a more complicated issue than uh, than we realize. But uh, I, th those are just some comments. I don't really have any questions, but maybe is there an is is there been an issue in the past? Uh, to any of testifiers regarding getting pay withheld uh, through this process. Maybe uh, Tamara's can uh, can address that or Patrick Lee can address that 
in terms of being able to get paid for your work, even though there's some litigation going on with the general contractor. Ms. Sunby or Mr. O'Halloran? Ms. Sunby, please proceed. Yeah, I, I've i been able to negotiate on the front end and have had to put out a lot of money. I have not ended up in litigation because I just have, I, I just cannot take these contracts. I can't even afford the opportunity to litigate. I mean, the fact that I would have to defend um, people of that size, I, I don't even have a chance if there is a, is a problem. I just have to, basically a couple times I've just walked away and not ever gotten paid. Okay. Representative Detmer. Yeah, I, you know, and that's been a, the stories I've been getting over the last few years. So yeah, I, I hope that can be worked out. And uh, you know, again, that's, that's legal things. I'm not a lawyer. Those are legal things that uh, have to be worked out with uh, maybe this bill can, uh, can help with that. So that's all I have. Thank you. Representative Greenman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and as a lawyer, I will leave all the legal stuff to judiciary. Um, the question I think I have for the testifiers, and maybe it's to you, Ms. Sumby, um, is how does our current law impact our ability for small subcontractors like you small businesses to be able to participate in particularly the public projects that we heard about? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, Ms. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair um, and members. Um, the project I was just speaking of, it, it's a large project for me and the contractor has come to me to ask me to be on it because I'm a disadvantaged business enterprise, which means the program is working in that respect. Um, delighted, love the program, um, but we we have to negotiate what I can't afford, and that's the contract terms. I can't afford to defend the water. You know, it's Met Council, and it, and it's a general contractor. So if I don't get these terms through, you know, I may not have work for the next six months. So it's affecting much on public projects and private also, but private, you know, it, it doesn't matter who it is. These, these terms, if, if it was just a law, just that one little law and we got it through, I'm, I'm, I think it would just help everyone, including generals. There's an agreement. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate your um, testimony. And I, I feel like we need to root our policy in um, the experiences and the work of folks like you. I will say as uh, uh, when I was in private practice as a lawyer, I did some of these cases and I can tell you that the legal bills and even the sort of threat and preparation for legal bills is a real big deal here. So I think that this is uh, just about fairness and I really appreciate uh, Representative Sundin bringing it. I plan to support it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative McDonald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Sandine. I support your bill. Uh, definitely uh, fairness, just this is the right thing to do completely. Uh, I do have a question for Mr. O'Halloran. Could I proceed? Please proceed. Mr. O'Halloran, first and foremost, uh, happy early St. Patrick's Day to you. And then secondly, uh, what do you, how do you respond to some of the concerns of the testifiers, MnDOT and the last two, with uh, the um, one of the words defend and other uh, other comments? So again, I'm going to support the bill. Uh, I have, I think we all have many friends that are subcontractors in the construction trades and want to uh, support them and uh, defend them and help them and bring some common sense to state law. But how do you address that, Mr. O'Halloran, to those concerns? Mr. O'Halloran. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative McDonald. Uh, thanks for the uh, St. Patrick's Day greeting. Uh, looking forward to another weird St. Patrick's Day this year. Hopefully <laughs> next year will be better. Um, uh, the, the thing, I, I guess the, the simplest thing I will say, a couple of things to, to address. There were a lot of comments made. I think there's a lot of comments that you hear about creating uh, an argument that this is complicated. And I think that's a really needless complexity. Because really, if you look at the bill, what it actually does in terms of the defend, it's very modest. And we're not equating defense and indemnity. We're just saying it's included, the word defend is included in the definition of a regulated <laughs> indemnity contract. We're not going to have an impact on insurance law in Minnesota. This part of the law addresses private risk transfer contained 
in building and construction contracts or on the public side on contracts for public works. This does not regulate contracts for insurance. And so we're not going to have an impact on all the law we talked about in terms of duty to defend or being broader than the duty to indemnify. Um, that's all true. I agree with those comments. Uh, but I will say that, that what, what the upstream parties, the owners and the general contractors who have testified seem to be saying is that it's fair for us to pass this obligation down to the small, uh, smallest party to the construction project and they'll have to take on all that risk. And in other words, they have to defend themselves. They have to defend other subcontractors on the project. They have to defend the general contractor on the project. And, and you're not going to get that money back. In the insurance context, I think that's, that's an okay result because you have insurance companies whose business model is, is structured on uh, assessing and sharing those risks across an entire industry through the sale of premiums and so on. Subcontractors do not have that kind of infrastructure to accurately assess and add that risk of other people's fault into their contract negotiations. Really, all the, the only change this makes is the difference between what subcontracts will, can still be required under this bill to defend a general contractor. It just will only be enforceable to the extent of their own fault or negligence. So if at the end of the day, there is an argument whether you owe the general contractor their attorney's fees, if you're at fault or you're 50% at fault or 30% at fault, that's the percentage of the fees you're going to have to pay. And that's probably fair because you've defended to the extent of your fault. And it's the same impact as the indemnity agreement is you're going to pay indemnity to the extent of your fault. And we don't have to now negotiate that because the bill will make that unenforceable except to the extent of your own fault or negligence. So I disagree with the arguments that this is circular and creates unintended consequences because really when you think about it, it's just the difference between paying for everybody's fault or just paying for your own fault. And we're still standing up and saying if we're at fault, yes, you can ask us to pay that. Even though you ask us to get insurance as well, there's still going to be enforceable defense obligations. They're just going to be fair. Senator McDonald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Halloran, for that expert opinion. And I also just want to state that uh, Representative Agreement's uh, advice as well from her experience as a lawyer was helpful too. So um, maybe Mr. Uh, Mrs. McGuff can uh, respond to that. Uh, if she chooses not to, that's fine, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Ms. McGuff, or Ms. Armstrong from McGuff. Yes, yeah, sorry, Mrs. Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're, Ms. Armstrong, you're muted or something there. Okay, let's try this again. There we go. Thank you. Uh, can you rephrase? I want to be sure I'm answering your specific question, what you, you want me to respond to. Uh oh, is that McDonald? Chair, Mr. O'Halloran, being a good attorney or all attorney, they have a long answer, so <laughs> I couldn't really, I couldn't really articulate exactly what he said. So, but he did say that it doesn't negate the bill, particularly does not negate the ability to defend and or um, identify uh, if there is a subcontractor that was negligible. I think you'll have to ask him again. Sure, Ms. Armstrong. Sure. Yeah. So as it relates to the defense obligation, I would say from a general contractor's perspective or even from a subcontractor's perspective, the way that we look at it, as we've talked about um, and Mr. County testified to, we don't understand and don't know at the time that uh, a plaintiff would make an, uh, a claim as to who are the at fault parties and what their proportionate share of it would be. So because McGuff, as a general contractor, has vicarious liability for every single subcontractor that it hires, what we say is, and in my example, you know, the subcontractors whose work is allegedly at fault would have to step up and pay those defense costs proportionately. And they're going to get the benefit of, like we said, we named four or five separate subcontractors in a lawsuit whose work may be at fault or is alleged to be at fault. And when we defend those obligations, they each pay that proportionate share and get the benefit of the defense costs. What we're saying, and to the point you're making with regard to who pays them and who knows them, 
certainly in every single case as a general contractor, we're not doing the work. The subcontractors are doing the work. The only share we have is for that vicarious liability. Without the language that we're asking for here and waiting until the end, we don't as a general contractor get a defense because nobody would be required to step up and pay that. So you're asking a general contractor to step up and pay all of the defense costs for every single subcontractor whose work is allegedly at fault during that period of time. And they get the benefit of that. If we do a good job in defending that and we pay all of those fees up front, all of those defense costs up front, and four of the five subcontractors have an apportionment of no fault against them then they'd have no obligation to reimburse me any of those defense costs when I've provided them with something of value free of cost to them and not having to pay any of those defense costs up front. So that's where we say there's a, a misapportionment and an, a reallocation of what's fair. We don't want anybody to have to pay for it. We certainly don't want to have to pay to defend things that we're not responsible for as a matter either. But that's not the way that the system works. McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, well, that's interesting. Uh, because of that, uh, Mr. Sundin, or Representative Sundin, that's not what your bill would do, correct? Correct. Representative Sundin. I think you have a good read on that, uh, Representative McDonald. Representative McDonald. Thank you. Uh, you know, she brings up a very good concern. We certainly don't want that to be the case, but uh, if uh, if our staff, nonpartisan staff, and uh, Representative Sundin uh, signify and uh, state that this the bill would not do that, then I think that uh, that should be some comfort to uh, the McGough group and others that are concerned with it. Thank, thank you, Representative McDonald. Any other member questions? Seeing no further comments, Representative Sundin, please renew your motion and any final camp comments on the bill. Yeah, I'll uh, renew my motion for 803 to uh, uh, for passage and uh, to send it on to judiciary. Um, I guess final comments. I would uh, I'd include uh, a, a little oversight or overview of uh, my career in the uh, construction industry uh, over 40 years and uh, dealing with uh, contracts, most of them labor contracts, but. Uh, uh, some otherwise, uh, the golden rule does exist. And that golden rule is those who have the gold uh, make the rules. And uh, that holds true in uh, many cases where the general contractors have full sway over uh, the, the lifelines to uh, financial success for uh, subcontractors. And uh, uh, to the uh, to require uh, project spe specific insurance uh, uh, assignment after the bidding process is uh, uh, kind of a scary situation. If you uh, bid the pro uh, bid the project and uh, you're awarded it, and then uh, in the contracts, uh, geez, all of a sudden you have to come up with uh, um, specific insurance uh, on top of uh, what you anticipated uh, for your uh, cost for the project. So. You know, at the uh, at the end of the day, I really do appreciate the uh, input from all the testifiers. Uh, I'm glad to uh, hear that uh, Ms. Armstrong is willing to work on this. I'm glad to hear that uh, Mr. County from uh, the DOT uh, supports the intent of this uh, bill as well. So uh, I think when we hit the Judiciary Committee, I think uh, we might have some refinement of this bill, and I certainly appreciate all the input from the committee. Representative Sundin moves that House File 803 as amended be re-referred to the Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committees. Ms. Doyle, please take the roll. Eckland. Yes. Eckland, aye. Vice Chair Dong. Aye. Dong, aye. Representative Detmer. Detmer, aye. Detmer, aye. Representative McDonald. Donald, aye. McDonald, aye. Representative Berg. Yes. Berg, aye. Representative Bliss. Aye. Bliss, aye. Representative Edelson. Representative Edelson. Representative Frederick. Aye. 
Frederick, aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman, aye. Representative Nelson. Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Poston. Aye. Poston, aye. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, aye. Raleigh, aye. Representative Sundin. Aye. Sundin, aye. Representative Edelson. There are 12 ayes, zero nays. 12 ayes and zero nays. The motion is approved and the bill is on its way. And members, Representative Edelson did text myself and the committee administrator that she had to step out. So the, I don't know if she had another committee to go to or what, what that was. Uh, bill's on its way, Representative Sundin. Uh, good luck in judiciary. Uh, members and staff, our next meeting is Tuesday, March 12th, 2021. Any questions or concerns from oh, March 12th? <laughs> we March missed 12th. that one. Yeah. <laughs> we missed it. Anyway. The 16th, Mr. Chair, the 16th. My apologies. Uh, next next Tuesday. There I go reading off the script again, but it is next Tuesday, uh, 2021, the 16th. Any questions from members? You'd be better off, Mr. Chair, to go off script sometimes. Maybe I would, Representative McDonald. Mr. Chair, it's a Friday. I appreciate everyone's indulgence in their flexibility and my ability to type up a chair, a script for the chair. So we don't normally have Friday hearings. So lots of mistakes. Seeing no questions or comments, we'll see you next Tuesday. We are adjourned. Thank you.